me all these beautifully sing about a small class of living organisms the ordinates or dragonfly those small in size dragonflies are amazing do you know they were the first winged insects to evolve some 300 million years ago they are more than 500 known species of dragonflies they belong to the order ordinata meaning toothed one in greek but they are harmless they are expert flyers flying like a helicopter straight up and down they have even inspired engineers in robotics they are a great control on mosquito population imagine they can eat 30 to 100 mosquitoes per day good afternoon everyone and welcome to the national symposium on conservation of ordinates jointly organized by the department of zoology of saint joseph college for women alapara and the department of zoology of velalar college for women erod under office of academic collaboration in association with the society for ordinate studies Kerala State Biodiversity Board and the BT Star College Scheme, Government of India. Now, I cordially invite Ms. Ramya James, Assistant Professor and Head Department of Zoology, St. Joseph College for Women, Alapra, Kerala, for the welcome address. Good afternoon, one and all. Respected principals, honored guests, dear participants. It is indeed a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to this national symposium on conservation of ordinates. Ordinator comprising of dragonflies and damselflies are beneficial to environment in many ways. And the aim of this symposium is to let all of you know regarding the importance of these organisms in our ecosystems. And with great pleasure, let me welcome Dr. Rita Lathadikoto, Principal, St. Joseph's College for Women, Alapura, and Dr. S.K. Jayanti, Principal, Vilala College for Women, Erod, who has supported us throughout the organization of this program. Welcome, Lata Madam and Jayanti Madam, to this event. Mrs. Rainy R. Pillai, Member Secretary, Kerala State Biodiversity Board, is here to grace the occasion. Warm welcome, dear Madam. Thank you. Thank you. This session will be handled by the esteemed writer and naturalist, Mr. V. Balachandran, who has spent numerous wildlife documentaries of Kerala Forest Department and is the executive member of Society for Ordinate Studies. With so much happiness, I welcome you, sir, to this event. Thank you. Special thanks and welcome to Dr. S.K. Kavita, Assistant Professor in Chemistry and Coordinator of Academic Office of Collaboration, Vilala College for Women, Erod. I'm happy and grateful that many students, research scholars, teachers, and many others from different parts of India have come together here to have knowledge sharing on ordinates. Welcoming you all wholeheartedly to this program. Last but not the least, my deepest gratitude and warm welcome to all the faculty members of the Department of Zoology, St. Jesus College for Women and Velala College for Women and members of SOS. Special mention to Dr. Indamadi, Dr. Kalaiwani and Sujit V. Kopalan. Hope all of us will have fruitful sessions and discussions on ordinates all these five days. Thank you very much. Ermina, over to you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. I warmly welcome Ms. Rini Artile, Member Secretary, Kerala State Biodiversity Board, Alapra, Kerala, for the inaugural address. Thank you, Ms. Ermina. And thank you, uh, Mrs. Remya James. Respected. Respected Dr. S.K. Jayanti, Principal Velalar College for Women, and Dr. Rita Lata, Principal St. Joseph's College for Women, Alapura, our esteemed resource person for the day, Sri V. Balajandran, Executive Member of SOS, and all the other resource persons who are following us in this program for the coming days, and all the organizing team of this national symposium, and my dear students of both of these colleges, uh, Bellalar College and St. Joseph's College, Alapura. 
A warm good afternoon to all of you. Actually, it is heartening to see that such a national symposium is organized by two esteemed colleges of South India, especially to celebrate a very small, lesser known group of insects that is odonates. We all know that wildlife or conservation mainly focus on or that usual practice was to focus on the bigger charismatic mammalian species. It is not too long that we have focused into smaller or lesser group or groups of uh, species like uh, odonates. So it is heartening to see that bigger esteemed institutions are showing interest into such groups. And saying about odonates, I am not delving into much details scientifically because we we have all the sessions uh, focused into such a topic, so I'm not going to uh, delve into any of scientific details, but I'll share a few of my experiences. I came from a college which is actually uh, very near to the Alapuda district. I'm a, I'm a student of Pandalam NSS College, wherein I haven't got much opportunity to be into the forest or uh, I was neither part of any uh, nature club or uh, forest club, anything like that. I was a very regular student uh, without any special or focused interest into any of the species or uh, biodiversity conservation during that time. Only when I got into the department, the forest, I, I'm actually a staff of the Kerala Forest Department. Only once I got into the department, I got an exposure into topics like conservation, wildlife, smaller group of uh, spe uh, animals like uh, odonates or butterflies like that but you are very lucky or fortunate to having got such opportunities uh, to be in such uh, an array of or in front of such an array of experts to know about such species and their role or significance in the environment so you are lucky enough anyway lucky than me but then coming into uh, the major issues that may be uh, highlighted through such a study. One thing is, all such group of animals or species have got their own significance. As we know, the conservation, the conservation of uh, biodiversity or wildlife conservation actually started with birds conservation. The primary species which got the interest of human beings as a study material, I think it was birds. The conservation movement, especially in uh, the Western countries, started with the, fur, uh, the protest against fur trade, conservation like that. So uh, it has now reached into a, another flying species, that is odonates. Earlier it was butterflies. But then the issues uh, that may limit our knowledge growth could be something like this. Once we go after one species, we may tend to focus whole, all of our learning into one species or a group of organism. But it should never be like that. Think about each group of animals or plants, anything, anything that you uh, focus upon. Think about such a group only as a door or opening into a vast world of uh, learning, learning and nature. It shouldn't be limited or it should not be uh, limiting your eyes of learning. So you should think about learning each of group, uh, each of a separate group in that way only. It should be your opening. Odonates also should be such an opening because they are very delicate group of organisms, interesting group of organisms. They will fascinate you definitely or any uh, uh, another small kid or a big individual alike. But should I follow that, should understand and that bigger universe and through learning odonates it should take you to another sphere of understanding the connectivity or interconnectedness of a bigger world where each and every group of organism have their role to play including human beings with that understanding only uh, the, the purpose of learning a separate group will become productive or become or it will tend to achieve the right objectives so with your focus of learning odonates shouldn't be limited to learning odonates alone. It should fascinate you, but the bigger nature also should 
fascinate you and you should learn much about the whole nature and your each and every uh, lifestyle or attitude should focus on positive constructive changes uh, towards the natural ecosystem i think that will be the bigger learning from the uh, study of odonis our resource persons will definitely uh, throw much scientific light into the subject they are bigger experts uh, esteemed experts well known in the scientific community regarding the subject so i think uh, that is uh, with these words i can limit my uh, stretch of knowledge delivery uh, with this with the permission of all the uh, dignified personalities here in this webinar uh, with your permission i declare that this national symposium on uh, knowing your knowing our dragons conservation of odonites as declared as inaugurated thank you thank you one and all especially the organizers i appreciate and congratulate all the organizers uh, for putting such big efforts into productive platform thank you thank you ma'am with much pleasure i welcome dr s k jayanti principal of velalar college for women e road tamil nadu for the felicitation thank you ma'am good afternoon to all honorable resource persons respected madam mrs remia james assistant professor and head st joseph's college for women alapula kerala respected madam mrs reni r pillai member secretary kerala state biodiversity board alapula kerala respected madam dr veeta lata principal st joseph's college for women alapula kerala and the resource person mr v balachandran executive member society for odonates studies and all of the guests and all others assembled here i am extremely proud to be a part on this special occasion national science day which commemorates the invention of the roman epic on the day february 28 1928 by the great indian physicist sir c v raman by celebrating this day as national science day we show our dignity and respect to the famous indian physicist especially from our state tamil nadu for his contribution in the field of science this year the theme of the national science day is future of sti that is science technology and innovation impacts on education skills and work first i would like to appreciate the team for their effort to make this joint venture that is the national symposium on conservation of odonates that is from 1st to 5th march 2021 jointly organized by the department of zoology st joseph's college for women alapula and department of zoology velana college for women ero under office of academic collaboration in association with society for odonate studies kerala state biodiversity board dbt department of biotechnology star college scheme government of india for this wonderful joint venture my hearty congratulations to the entire team for both the departments that is department of zoology from kerala and department of zoology from velana college for women on behalf of the management and on my own behalf i consider it as a unique privilege to extend my heartfelt appreciation to the entire team who has arranged this wonderful national symposium for the five days that is from 1st march to 5th march the main objective of the national science day is to spread the message of importance of science and its application among the students science is a best invention of universe without science there is no change in the world science and everyday life cannot and should not be separated the essence of science is independent thinking 
innovation, imagination, and hard work. This day is also celebrated in our daily life to shed light on the importance of science so that the achievements and efforts in the field of science for human welfare. Hence, National Science Day is celebrated to discuss important issues in the field of science. They have chosen the wonderful topic that is conservation of ordinates. Let me conclude with this some short message, short message. Everything is theoretically impossible until it is done. Everything is theoretically impossible until it is done. Science never solves a problem without creating 10 more. Science never solves a problem without creating 10 more problems. Science may set limits to knowledge but should not set limits to imagination and innovation. Science may set limits to knowledge but should not set limits to imagination and innovation. I certainly believe that the engagement of faculties and students attending today and will be attending for five more days will certainly make this national symposium fruitful and productive. We are very warm welcome to all of you and I hope that the symposium will be fruitful and your next few days here will be a productive and also enjoyable one. Happy National Science Day. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now, I gladly invite Dr. Rita Lada Dikoto, Principal of St. Joseph College for Women, Alapura, Kerala, for the felicitation. <coughs> Esteemed Principal of VCW College, the inspiring and dynamic leader, Dr. S.K. Jayanti, the member secretary of the Kerala State Biodiversity Board, Mrs. Rini Arpile, the heads of departments of the two collaborating colleges, Ms. Ramya James and Dr. D. Indumati, the resource persons and experts from the Society of Ordinate Studies, uh, Mr. Sujit Vigopalan, Sri Balachandran, and other experts. The coordinator of the Office of Academic Collaborations of VC VCW College, Dr. V.S. Kavita. All other participants of this seminar. A very uh, warm good afternoon to all of you. Uh, Remya, I would just like to interrupt a minute to ask whether I'm audible because I'm getting a lot of background noise. Yes, ma'am, you're audible. Okay, so it must be in my system. Okay, so the uh, principal of ECW College, Dr. S. K. Jayanti, has very comprehensively brought out the significance of National Science Day, and so I will not be dwelling any more on that. On on that. But I would just like to say a few words about the significance of the particular symposium which is being hosted by both colleges. So we know that celebrating and protecting diversity is biodiversity especially is a concern that is very urgent and very existential. And many recent events and ecological disasters globally have brought out the interdependence of humans and the webs of life in which they rest, which cover a variety of unique species. So I must say that when Ms. Remya James, the HOD of the Department of Zoology of our college, when she first approached me with a proposal for conducting a national symposium on the conservation of ordinary in collaboration with the Department of Zoology of the reputed uh, BCW College E Road and the Society for Ordinate Studies. The first question 
which came up in my mind, a rather inadequately informed mind with regard to this topic, and with just a peripheral knowledge of this unique group of insects. The question which came up was, can this group be so very significant as to hold an entire national symposium based on them? And fortunately, I do not voice this concern out aloud because I do not want to demonstrate my ignorance being a commerce a professor. I didn't want to demonstrate my lack of knowledge about uh, this particular group to a science teacher. However, this dismay which I felt at that time led me to do a little research on the area. And I must confess that I was amazed and fascinated by the wealth of intriguing knowledge that came my way on just a very brief and cursory study of the topic. So I learned that these odonids, the suborders of which are dragonflies and damselflies, they sent an unparalleled insect model for the study of the evolution of insects. And because of the unique evolutionary innovations, they serve as bioindicators of freshwater ecosystems worldwide. And there are many unique features, such as a complex life cycle, their flight behavior, and their sensitivity to anthropogenic, anthropogenic change, makes them a very promising focal area for genomics research. So they are increasingly used as indicators of the aquatic ecosystem quality and biodiversity because they have very well-known habitat, habitat requirements and they can be easily identified too. Besides, I think we all know that they are effective uh, controllers of the mosquito population and uh, because of this, they are also protectors of the environment because they reduce our dependence on pesticides. So, since I do not have that much scientific knowledge on this area, but what really struck me reading more about dragonflies <coughs> was that beyond the academic significance of the dragonfly, I, I found out, or I rather felt, that most of the qualities which we human beings need to survive in these turbulent times of COVID are associated with these insects. The fact that they are one of the first winged insects to evolve some 300 million years ago, it definitely shows their resilience, their adaptability, especially and uh, their ability to change their flight patterns comfortably in midair. I believe this signifies a much needed quality of adaptability that we need to survive today. The need to gain a fresh perspective in, in different situations when we are faced with challenge. All these qualities can be found in these dragonflies and damselflies. They also say they symbolize our ability to connect with our strength, our inner strength, and our creativity even, and to overcome times of hardship. So I, I would think that, I mean, I, I'm really grateful to the uh, uh, departments of both colleges, the collaborating departments, for even giving me the chance to learn a little more about the fascinating nature of this unique group. So uh, the, uh, the uh, poet, I do not remember her name, but I remember this uh, two lines of poetry. Magic is seeing wonder in nature's every little thing. Seeing how wonderful the fireflies are and how magical are the dragonflies. So may this national symposium ignite that spark within each one of us to search for, understand and be inspired by the magic and the mystery inherent in every little creature that inhabits the universe. May it renew our pledge to celebrate and protect the rich biodiversity of the world in which we live. A word of congratulation to the organizing departments of both our colleges. We know the VCW College has always been an inspiration to each and every teacher of our college and to me personally. 
with their proactive attitude, their excellent dynamic leadership, and their commitment to quality and excellence. The two, the and their very, very heartwarming initiatives of which we have been a part. We have been fortunate to have been a part of some of the initiatives. I must congratulate their principal, their leadership, their management, and the dynamic coordinator of the Office of Academic Collaborations, Dr. S. K. Kavita, for all their quality enhancement initiatives. I especially appreciate the commendable work done by the Society for promoting this ordinate studies, a much needed area of research. And I'm sure that this will definitely contribute to many of the young researchers in our group among the participants to really be inspired and do more promising work in these areas. So I wish the symposium all success. I offer my most heartfelt congratulations and good wishes to all the collaborating the co colleges and the agencies and have a very enriching symposium, everyone. And thank you for this great privilege and honor to be a part of this wonderful uh, this uh, wonderful academic exercise. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. I invite Dr. S.K. Kavita, Assistant Professor of Chemistry and Coordinator of Academic Office Collaboration, to speak a few words. Respected principals of both institutions, Dr. S.K. and Dr. And Mrs. Lai, the member secretary of Kerala State Board Biodiversity Board, and the eminent resource person of the session, Mr. V. Balachandran, all the faculty members, uh, especially the heads of the both collaborating departments, Mrs. Remya James and Dr. D. Indumati, my dear students, and all the other faculty members and participants from various other institutions, a warm good afternoon to everyone. It gives me immense pleasure to see that another milestone of the MOU that is existing between both institutions is being taken up today. We both, means St. Joseph College for Women and Velalar College for Women, have entered into an MOU in the month of February 2020. Immediately after the signing of MOU, students from our uh, zoology department visited your esteemed institutions, during which they found the visit very useful, inspiring, and the hospitality that was extended is still memorable for them. After such a fruitful visit, though we had to go for a lockdown immediately, during the lockdown period also, the activities between our institutions did not stop. We, in collaboration with few other institutions in the other state, have organized uh, one interstate cluster of colleges webinar for about one week during the lockdown period, the means of which we proved ourselves to be the forerunners in adapting ourselves to the online mode of collaboration even during the lockdown period. So that was a memorable program uh, that was held uh, with the coordination of both our, uh, both our institutions. And in the series of our collaborative activities, this is the third program. This National Symposium for Conservation of Ordinates is the third program in our collaborative series. And I am very heartened to be uh, a part of this program and wishing this program a grand success. As Longfellow rightly said, the heights by great men reached and kept were not attained in a sudden flight. But they, while their companions slipped, were toiling upward in the night. And I understand, I've seen, I've realized that both the departments were toiling upward for the past uh, uh, two, three weeks for bringing out such an excellent program online, uh, which is going to be very uh, useful for not only for both the institutions, but also for the participant, participants from various other institutions. So my sincere appreciation, wishes, and uh, hearty congratulations, especially to the heads of both departments, the faculty members of the zoology department of both institutions, and the students of both uh, institutions for having taken tireless efforts in organizing a program of this kind, which is not only uh, going to be beneficial for the students and faculty members in the uh, uh, subject area, but also it will um, uh, bring uh, the bonding that is existing between our institutions uh, strengthened further. And I hope the collaboration between our institutions will be extended further to many other departments as well in the days to come. So with the hope to have many such academic ventures in the days to come, I extend my sincere congratulations and hearty wishes for the program to be a very successful one. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks one and all.
Thank you, ma'am, for the talk. Sri V. Balachandran, executive member, Society for Ordinate Studies, who is a naturalist, is with us today as a resource person to have a talk on the topic Introduction to Ordinate with emphasis on their significance in the ecosystem. We are so glad to have you with us. Let's lend our ears for his valuable talk on the subject. Um, very good afternoon and thank you, Vermina, uh, for uh, welcoming me. And uh, at the outset, let me tell you that I am so humbled and awed that uh, I have to present my my pet, my passion for ordinates before such an august audience of academics and researchers and students. Uh, I mean, it's a matter of, for me, not personally, more than personally, for the society of ordinates that I, uh, uh, ordinate studies that I represent, the SOAS, and uh, for the dragonflies, all the dragonflies of work, I, on behalf of the dragonflies, I thank you for uh, giving this opportunity. Principal uh, St. Joseph's Hall of Jalapi, and Principal Balala College of Women, and Madam Renee Pele of uh, Kerala State Biodiversity Board, with whom we had uh, last week, we had concluded a series of webinars. So, uh, thank you uh, all, and I will begin my, I don't know whether as I'm, I'm just a mature naturalist. All I have is a passion, you know, I'm, I'm a passion verging on uh, madness, I would say, to be very honest, on for dragonflies. So, what I hope is that I'll be able to impart some of my passion to all of you youngsters who are old enough to be my children or even grandchildren. So, uh, I will begin without too much ado. Uh, another thing I just remembered is that my first presentation ever on dragonflies was before uh, the Ayapa College for Women in Nagarbo. I speak uh, Tamil also. So, uh, you know, Tatambuchi. The students from uh, Iro would be remembering that Tatambuchi. That is what is called uh, dragonflies are called in Tamil. So that is my first ever representation. So I, I fondly remember that occasion, and that is how I started on my path of uh, promoting dragonfly conservation. Now we'll go into the subject. But before that, uh, I would like to say that you know my what I have been asked to talk to you or asked to discuss with you is introduction to ordinates with uh, you know, special emphasis on their uh, ecosystem, uh, isn't it? Thing is, when I look at the other, uh, the forthcoming um, programs in the next uh, four days, uh, so more or less, these are all uh, quite uh, interrelated, you know, like uh, Vivek is talking about focus on wetlands. That's an ecosystem of Dr. Pangesh Kapardi. Dr. Pangesh Kapardi is a very close friend of mine, and he is talking about uh, climate change studies. Then Sujit Gobali is talking about the monitoring ecosystem. So these are all, all of the topics that uh, seem to be very interrelated and uh, uh, there could be some overlapping of uh, the same thing, but you'll be able to hear different perspectives like uh, from an amateur uh, naturalist like me to professionals, academics like uh, Dr. Pangas Papadi, researchers like uh, Vivek Sandar, conservation biologists like uh, Sujit Gopal. So you'll be able to uh, listen to very different perspective, even though we are talking about the same subject. So I'm sure uh, you'll be uh, uh, you'll be enchanted <laughs> by the, uh, the, the next uh, four days. So now I'll uh, start uh, sharing my screen. Okay. Uh, can you see the sc uh, screen now, madam? Yeah, yes, sir. It's visible. Uh, so once again, uh, good afternoon, team. So I am uh, going to talk to you in general about ordinates. That is.
to the larger in larger areas far away places so uh, dispersal dispersal of any uh, species uh, you know helps that uh, helps the population to thrive and the design of the body like you see the body is very streamlined the dragonfly body is very streamlined uh, and uh, see the you know the wings 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 are very important uh, you know factor in the survival of dragon uh, dragonfly because this they can move the uh, wings in any direction they can and they can by moving the wings by flying they can move forward backward sideways and they can even hover would have if you have noticed that dragonfly you have seen that uh, you know dragonflies hover in the air and that's why in um, north india you know many people call uh, dragonflies as helicopter even the common people call it helicopter because they because of their ability to hover in the uh, air so and their eyes very powerful eyes with 30000 lenses so the, all these characteristics have helped, helped uh, ordinates to survive now i'll just this is uh, just a uh, 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 slide on the diversity of uh, dragonflies uh, there are about 6300 plus species in the world western ghats has 196 species and kerala uh, has 175 species this is a latest figure but this figure is growing you know we are discovering every year we discover one or two new species uh, the why is uh, you know dragonflies are comparatively a lesser studied group uh until the uh you know what you call the fauna of british india you know volume 1 2 and 3 on ordinates by uh, russian journal dr fraser which was published in in the, in the early 30s until then there was no comprehensive studies on dragonflies so even after that there was a lag in dragonfly studies and, and only in the uh 80s or late 70s and 80s uh you know dragonfly started grabbing the attention of uh, zoologists and uh, researchers so uh, even in our western ghats there are bound to be uh, many species to be discovered and even uh, you know some of the species that uh, fraser described in, uh, in the 30s in the 1930s uh, in this in this fauna of uh, british india we are yet to see them either they may have become extinct or very likely uh, we are because many species Uh, you know they live in small micro habitats and they are not they cannot be seen everywhere some species you know uh, so that's the that's one of the reason that even now it, despite the fact that uh, their habitats basically the wetlands forests are all disappearing at a very fast rate despite that we are uh, you know we are still discovering new species and it is also due to the hardiness you know the survival capability of the dragonflies now this is something uh, quite uh, familiar to you mm. as a zoology students <clears throat> so this come under the class in sector the order is ordinator you know why it is called ordinator odonto in in some greek means tooth tooth the animal so dragon flies have a large uh, tooth like appendage in their mouth with which uh, they you know uh, crush and eat the prey so that's why they are called ordinator and ordinator as you know uh, i'm just uh, this is all these are all things which like being zoology students and professors you all know it but i'm just you know uh, saying this as a net part of the introduction the suborders are anisoptera and uh, zygoptera now that was the, just till recently there were three uh, suborders called anisoptera zygoptera and there was another called anisozygoptera this anisozygoptera uh, which had uh, which has or which had rather four uh, species of epiophlebia uh, dragonfly epiophlebia late lobby is found in uh, you know himalayas which has a long uh, you know life as, as larva why that was considered as a third support because it exhibited both the characteristics of both dragonflies and damselflies both the anisoptera and zygoptera but uh, recently or the last one or two years i think but more than that maybe in the last decade or so uh the, the taxonomists they have reclassified they have added it into anisoptera then it is now called epiproptera so now the latest uh, this thing is epiproptera and zygoptera 
So you don't have to, uh, unless you are, you know, interested uh, with history, evolution of taxonomy. Uh, you don't have to study Anisos Zygoptera as a special thing. Uh, these two suborders are enough. Now this is uh, to show you the basic difference. Uh, I wondered uh, how many of you, young ladies, have visited the field, uh, visited the forest. Uh, to my knowledge, my wife is a boss, a professor in Bautry. In Trivandrum, and uh, she used to take uh, her students to the field, to the forest, to study plants and trees and all that. And uh, she always, uh, you know, say that those students who had been taken to the outdoor, taken to the field, have shown tremendous improvement in their uh, studies. So zoology and uh, botany, you know, life sciences like this, these are not to be studied, uh, you know, in in, certain, in the cloister of. Uh, uh, classrooms. It doesn't matter whether you are a woman or a man. Uh, you have to, if you are a student of uh, life sciences like zoology, you have to go out into the field. I mean, it doesn't have to be the forest, you know. These things are all around you. Wherever there is water, you will find the tracking place. So, all you have to do is go outdoor and, uh, you know, uh, observe them. So, uh, <laughs> I always, whenever I talk, I take classes to students. I always, you know, exhort them to, you ask your teachers to take you to the field. Field studies must be compulsory. You know, zoology must be taught under the shade of uh, trees or by the side of a stream or something like that. So uh, uh, after this uh, series of lectures are over, uh, I hope uh, the students of both colleges will pester their uh, teachers to take to, uh, take you to the field. Now, uh, this is, I'm sorry for that uh, diversion. Uh, this is dragonfly and damselfly. So, so, so right from the picture, you can see the difference between the two suborders. Uh, I have written the, uh, you know, the, the, the differences there. You can see that the dragonfly, when 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 they are resting, they always keep their wings open, and for the damselfly, the wings are always closed. And of course, there is a small exception uh, that one particular family called Listidae, they keep their uh, you know wings slightly apart. So, but uh, from the other uh, aspect, you will uh, aspects you will recognize it as a damsel fly, and uh, you see the shape of the wings, the, the the hind wings, large hind wings, the dragonfly, whereas damsel flies, they have all the wings are the same shape and size, and uh, you know, dragonflies are you know more uh, what do you, should I say masculine, like a thick body, stout, and they are very strong flyers. Uh, you know, some can fly up to 97 kilometers per hour. That's quite uh, fast, isn't it? And uh, the difference, another difference is the position of the eyes. Most of the dragonfly families, they have their eyes very close, large, huge eyes very close to each other, almost touching to each other, except for one particular family. I think uh, Vivek Sandran will be talking to you about that. And in dancing flies, you'll see, you see that the eyes are separate. You know, there's a, some gap between the two eyes. So, these are the ways uh, which you can immediately recognize which is a dragonfly and dancer fly. Now, uh, I don't know how many of you have seen antlion. You know, antlion and outfly. Antlion is actually uh, for Malayali students, maybe I don't know in Tamil also, I don't know what you call it in Tamil. There's something called Kuriana. That is, this, uh, there are small insects that makes small, uh, small uh, conical, you know, uh, pits in the sand, and they wait, uh, you know, they hide under the, the tip, of the you know, the cone, and when some insect passes by, they throw sand pebbles at them, and when the you know insect fall, when the prey falls into the pit, they eat them. That's actually the larvae of this ant -like. To some, it may look like a drag, a dance will fly, but it is not. Now, what is the basic difference here? You see the antenna, I'll uh, show this. See, these are the antennae, you know, long antennae. So, owl fly has long antennae, and ant lion also has long antennae. Whereas, when you see the closer picture of a, a dragonfly or dance will fly, you will see that they have very short antennae. So, that's one of the most noticeable differences. And then there are, of course, uh, when you gain experience, you will immediately recognize that these are not dragonflies. So I am just showing you, these are some similar 
you know, because and this previously they were all together in uh, what we call a neuroptera order. Later on, later on only this was uh, you know divided into different um, orders. These are all again. I'm sure you know it, but I'm just uh, telling you again. This is the structure of a dragonfly the morphology, whereas you where you can see the uh, you know this the head and the thorax and the abdomen. Usually in Malayalam we call it wal tail. It's not a tail, it's an abdomen. And uh, they have four wings, the pterostigma. Pterostigma is the black spot, which is different from species to species. The color, the pattern is different, which uh, helps them to glide and, you know, maintain balance. And they have rather long legs. But unfortunately, these, not unfortunately, these legs are not uh, used for uh, walking. The dragonflies cannot walk. They can only grab sticks and grab insects, but they catch prey while in flight. So these legs enable them to enable, enable them to catch it and uh, you know uh, eat eat them. So that's why that's what the legs are used for. And here again, uh, uh, some differences between the I mean some special features for dragonfly. Even though they have a very large nose-like appendage, uh, it is not actually it's called fronds. That's not uh, they they breathe through what you call spiracles. There are small holes in the abdomen, you know, the sides of the abdomen, and air is supplied directly to the abdomen. And we all know that you know insects don't have blood like uh, mammals. Uh, what they have instead is hemolymph. Uh, so that's a kind of a blood for uh, an animal. And omatidia, omatidia, this is a fantastic. This is one of the most wonderful thing about a dragonfly. These high eyes have uh, thirty thousand lenses. How many lenses do we have? We have two lenses, isn't it? Now these guys have 30,000 lenses. So they give them a very sharp eyesight, which is why they are one of the most successful predators. Where compared to even the lions or tigers or big mammals, the success rate in predation is very high, 90% or something like that for dragonflies, whereas it's only 50 or 60% for the lions. So that's, like I said earlier, these special features, uh, these quirky, quirky things about their body, that's one of the basic reasons why they have survived for long. We also have survived for quite long, you may think, but not as long as dragonfly. And I don't, I'm sure, uh, you know, dragonflies will outlive uh, us also. And again, here you, you can see, I'll show you. You see the small antennae of the dragonflies. These antennae is uh, they can have, they've got some slight sense of smell uh, because using this antennae, and of course they are they cannot hear they cannot make any sound. You might have uh, heard noises in the in evenings. You know, sometimes dragonfly come into our homes. They like they come to catch uh, some prey or something, and uh, uh, they make a kind of a you know flickering sound uh, with their wings. So it is not a sound that they make. The, the sound of the uh, wings. Okay, now <clears throat> we'll go to the life cycle. Uh, life cycle of the uh, species. So, dragonflies invariably 99%, 99.9% of the species lay egg in water. Depending upon the species, uh, the eggs mature in uh, 5 to 40 days to the larvae, and uh, usually they have 9 to 15 instars. Most of them have 9 to 10 instars. Some species have longer, longer life. They have a, longer number of, a larger number of instars. And in about two to six months, uh, they emerge as a dragonfly. What you see down on the right is the newly emerged uh, uh, dragonfly. It's a damselfly, actually. When I say dam dragonfly, generally, uh, the practice is you, for both the species, you, you use the word dragonfly in common. But when you are talking about damselfly in specific, you say dance, but that's the usage, you know. And then uh, after uh, emerging, you know, in one to two weeks, they become mature and uh, they live for, uh, again, depending on the species, for two to three months as adults, as flying, as aerial uh, creatures. And after that, they die. Now, these are the different uh, oviposition or uh, egg laying. There are basically two types, exophytic and endophytic. Exophytic is they, what they do is they drop their eggs over the water, over the water body. They lay hundreds of eggs, 
several hundreds dragonflies uh, lay several hundreds damsel fly also lays 100 to 400 eggs and then what you see uh, down on the left is an endophytic pole position that is the females have a special appendage kind of a stylus like thing uh, at the end of their uh, uh, abdomen the tail so with that they make a small tear in the uh, leaves and then they drop their eggs there after some time these eggs will drop this, this all these eggs are held together with uh, some kind of a glutinous substance and then they drop into the water on the right lower thing you uh, lower side you see uh, a very pretty little uh, dragonfly called tetra tetrathemis platyptera what it does is it uh, you know uh, you know fixes uh, you know drops the, its eggs on the pigs you know leaning with pigs are leaning uh, you know near the water bodies and uh, from there, the eggs will slowly drop off after some time. Now, uh, sorry, uh, now I will show you uh, a small video of the uh, egg laying uh, of the uh, one dragonfly and one damselfly. And while showing that, I will uh, you know describe this thing. Uh, Madam, please tell me if the video is visible or not. Okay. See, this is a male of Anax maculifrox. And the uh, earlier thing you, you saw is the female of the Anax maculifrox. She is laying eggs. And this male is, uh, you know, standing nearby, is sitting nearby. It's actually guarding the uh, female laying eggs because if the male leaves the site, what will happen is he's got so many rivals, you know, competitors, so many rival males. What these males, this is a very interesting uh, you know, uh, feature of dragonflies. What the other males will do is they will grab the egg laying female and with the special, special you know, um, appendage in their body, which I will uh, describe in detail uh, later, they will scrape out the eggs formed by the, uh, this, I mean, eggs, eggs developed by the, by this uh, dragonfly sperms, they will scrape it out, mate with the female, and so that she will, uh, you know, lay new eggs. So, uh, in order to avoid that, actually what happens is, uh, you know, when they mate, the, the, the sperm is, uh, the female pushes the sperm deeply into her body and then the eggs are formed. So before that, the other rival males, will, what they will do is they will come and scrape out the semen of the uh, sperm of the, you know, uh, the, the earlier male. So in order to avoid that, in order to ensure that uh, his own progeny comes out, the male stands guard. So here we see that uh, the female is laying eggs inside the in, inside the water among the underwater uh, plants. I will not uh, uh, show you a little more. This about slightly, not very long. So you see how the male is uh, hovering about the female. Uh, he is always on the lookout for. Uh,
breed through these uh, pools. I mean, these dirty pools. What happens is in the Silent Valley, these trees are uh, you know chopped off. Uh, if the trees are removed, they will lose their habitat, and again uh, they will die. So always remember. What, what what you are doing is when you study a creature, you are studying the habitat also. You are studying its environment also. You cannot separate this, this the, these two. You cannot separate this. Uh, you know, you cannot take out the individual animal from its habitat. And on below below you see another uh, species. This is a unique species found in Hawaii, Megala green species. Their uh, larvae are terrestrial. That is, the, those larvae survive in moist. Uh, Soil, not uh, purely, not water. So this is one of the few exceptions. Here you see a cross section of uh, a, a land, like um, what you can see is a river. There's some river bank. There's some channel, some meadow, some bushes, and all in this uh, diagram, what you can see is that all these parts of uh, the ecosystem. This is used by the Dragonfly for either for larval development or mate seeking or pairing or oviposition or even roosting everything. So when you protect the uh, when you say conserve the wetlands, it's not that uh, you know you can you should conserve only the water body, but you should uh, you know conserve uh, the surrounding uh, land also. Now we come to the uh, foraging part, or eating. First of all, you should understand that uh, dragonflies are carnivores. Yeah? You might have noticed some dragonflies sitting on the tip of a flower, or you know something very romantic, uh, you know, looking out, uh, looking at the flower, or you know, as if it is smelling the its uh, fragrance. But no, actually, what they do is they are perching on a you know top plant, uh, the, the top of a plant, and looking out for prey or uh, a mate. So they are uh, 100% carnivores. Carnivores in this sense, they they eat anything that can they, they can grab, and their own species. They Eat, feed on dragonflies also. Here, what you see is a larvae, uh, larvae catching dragonfly larvae catching a small fish. And here you see different uh, dragonflies. This is on the left top. You see Ichthyogonus rapax. It's one of very magnificent looking, fairy looking creature. This uh, is the Crocodilus cervelia female. And on the left uh, right side, you see Euphia fraseri, a beautiful damsel fly found in forest. Eating some insect, and on the left below you see uh, a dragonfly called ditch jewel or Brachytemis contaminator. It is eating the head of a male of a dragonfly. It's a, it's a microcephalum, dragon microcephalum. It is uh, while the male was holding the female, you know the the other the dragonfly came and grabbed. Them. Uh, and uh, uh, I have missed one slide. They are cannibals. Cannibals in the sense they eat uh, individuals of the same species. That is, a ditch jewel can eat, will eat a ditch jewel itself. You know, same species or they don't. They have no, uh, you know, they don't make any difference in that. They make no distinction in that. Now, uh, when like uh, the, what is that special emphasis, significance on the ecosystem, like um, I think Madam Huspel too uh, said. Mosquito, as, as a larvae and as an adult, mosquito is one of the favorite food of uh, dragonflies. You know, the larvae also eat, uh, thrive on mosquitoes. Some species, some uh, dragonfly species, they specialize on mosquitoes. So that's why uh, uh, we call dragonflies as the friend of human, the man's friend. Even though that uh, classification of animals like uh, man's friend and man's enemy, uh, it's a calling them agricultural pests. This kind of negative connotations, negative words, I find it highly objectionable because we cannot, how can you say that uh, uh, a cricket or uh, uh, some insect is a pest just because it is eating something uh, that uh, you have planted? That's not a pest. That is, it is eating. It, is, it has a right to survive in the world just like us, isn't it? So, uh, whenever you study agricultural entomology, they'll say this is an agricultural pest. They classify it as that, isn't it? So there is no pest, believe me. There are if there is one pest in the whole planet Earth. That's us Homo sapiens. We are the pests. We are the parasites. You understand? I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not uh, exaggerating. But that's the truth. 
If you reflect upon it, you will find that. Now, uh, in some countries, dragonflies, like I said, dragonflies prefer mosquitoes very much. And in some countries, this is uh, uh, news cutting, news press cutting of a, a study in Chennai. But in uh, Thailand and some other countries, they have done successful experiments by breeding dragonflies uh, to control dengue fever hmm? by controlling uh, the mosquito population. So, a friend of man, indeed. Hmm? Ah, here I'm uh, sorry, the cannibalism uh, in this slide was uh, slightly misplaced. Now, here what you see is they are eat, catching the, you know, the eating species, individuals of the same species. So this is what is meant by cannibalism. This is not an uncommon phenomenon in uh, the world of uh, insects. Now we come to the territoriality. Who is, who has this territorial thing? Like, uh, uh, this is a man's or male's prerogative. You know, males have to find an ideal place for laying eggs, for ovipositing. You understand? So, since it is all done in the water, what the males do is when uh, when they are ready to mate, uh, when they sense that females, females usually uh, keep away from the water until they are ready to mate. So, by the time females come out, the males will, uh, you know, uh, create their own little, defend their own little territory. For small damsel flies, it might be one meter or two meter. Big dragonflies, it be 50 meters or a stretch of a uh, stream. So, they, they fight each, each other, they threaten each other, they don't kill, uh, you know, or, you know, hurt each other like humans do. But they, uh, you know, threaten each other and uh, uh, the success of the victor will uh, have occupy that little territory. And when the female comes, they will meet. So, their territoriality is basically uh, to, for all positive, for, you know, just like uh, we, you know, getting, uh, getting married and, you know, live in a house, just like that. So there's nothing, you know, very, uh, di very much different uh, between ourselves and uh, this dragonflies. And here you see uh, what you see is courtship. Even though comparatively, you know, unlike birds uh, or some mammals, uh, the courtship of dragonflies is much shorter. But what they do is, you know, they the male flies around the female, you know, showing off its wings, the colors of the wings colors of the uh, legs, you know, that sort of courtship signs. And the female will look on, well, good, this is a handsome young man, so I will mate with him. So, uh, this kind of aerial dancing or showing off by the male, this is, uh, this is, may not be very unfamiliar to you. Huh? You would have find the young men, you know, showing off themselves, you know, combing their hair and you know, putting sunglasses, you know? that sort of, you know, wearing you know, uh, very, very masculine looking dress. These are all Signs that these are what I'm saying is these are all instincts, you know. When you find some young man, you know, staring at you and swaggering around, what he is, he is acting according to his instincts. He is not behaving badly. This is part of our nature, nature of life, to court the female, make uh, to, to mate, to you know, live together. These are all a part of our basic instincts. So don't look at th these things with a negative eye. I'm, Speaking this with the liberty of a, you know, I'm old enough to be a grandfather, so that's why I'm taking such uh, liberties. Okay. Now, this, are, uh, this is how dragonflies mate. This is called heart wheel position or heart position. I will come to the, I'll show you a video uh, and I will show you how uh, the, the, the speciality of the, uh, you know, reproductive organs uh, of the dragonflies. This is just to show you how after courtship, the dragonflies meet. Now, this is one uh, special feature. Am I, am, am I taking too long? It's about nearly one hour. Madam, how much time do I have? Hello? Hello? Uh, sir, okay. we thought to uh, end the program by some 3.45 or so, sir. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll, take, uh, I'll finish it in 45 minutes. Okay. I mean, sorry, uh, by 3.45. Okay, uh, look, now, these are, uh, these are the two, you know, male reproductive organ. Like, in the primary, at the primary organ at the end of the abdomen, that's where sperm is produced. And before mating, it transfers, by bending the abdomen, it transfers the 
the sperm to the secondary organ below the thorax. So this is this, that's why you see the female, you know, bending itself and attaching to the male like that in the, the, in the shape of a heart. So uh, the second uh, secondary this thing is called hamulus. So this is how they do it. What they do is the male after courtship finds the female, grabs her by the prothorax, that is the back of the neck, and then they fly around for some time. And the second photograph you see how the male is transferring uh, its uh, sperms, and uh, down below that you have see the is the heart position or heart uh, shape, wheel shape, and then you see the ovipost. Now, uh, uh, because since the time is less, I'll show you uh, briefly. Uh, a video. So, so now you see how uh, the uh, the mating process is. This is a beautiful little video, but uh, since we don't have much time, I'm cutting short. Now uh, we come to one of the another interesting aspect of uh, dragonfly life called migration. Hmm? Uh, what you see here is one of the uh, com most common dragonflies called Pantala flaviscans or global wanderer, which you would have noticed in the thousands at the time of the northeast monsoons. In the map, you will see that uh, they fly down from uh, the other parts of India to the western coast, like in Kerala, at the time of this uh, northeast monsoons. And when the northeast monsoon winds blow, uh, they go along in that uh, wind to Africa. They migrate to Africa. Can you imagine? They travel about to and and up from Afri Africa in the southwest monsoon. They come back to India. Altogether, that's about eighteen thousand kilometers. They migrate. But not the same individual. They do this cycle of uh, migration in four generations. You understand? So this, uh, why they migrate, it's still a mystery. Uh, but this is one of the longest uh, migrating uh, insects, or even even among birds. Of birds fly a uh, migrate long, longer distance, but uh, this is one of the longest uh, migrating uh, dragonflies. And here you see uh, some dragonfly watches uh, in. The paddy fields near Trichu, and all the uh, pantala flaskins flying around them. This is uh, another phenomenon called thermoregulation, where uh, you know how the heat is controlled. What what you see here is what we call obelisk posture, by which when there is the when there is too too much of a heat, they shade their thorax by using the wings. So this is a very when you observe uh, uh, dragonflies, you will see them in the. Sitting in the sun, and when it is cold in the morning, they will bask in the sun to warm up their body because they are cold-blooded. And flight season, you don't see all the species in uh, all the time. Some species you see uh, throughout the year, and many most of the species you see uh, only the after the rainy season, uh, during the rainy season, or early rainy season to say like from May to September or October. Uh, the reason is some uh, some species have uh, you know shorter life as uh, larvae, so they have they are multi -ultane. That is, the same uh, year they breed more, more than one time. So that's why some species are seen all the uh, throughout the year, and some are seen only uh, once a year or so. And roosting, here you see like all of us dragonflies like to sleep or rest. Some, most of them, you know, sleep under the grass or the branches. Some, uh, and even daytime, they take rest. When the body heat is too high, they go and uh, you know, take rest. And we come to the last uh, section, uh, there is mortality. Now, what you see here is uh, mm, some defective uh, body, like defective, uh, defective wings or thorax, uh, sorry, abdomen, twisted abdomen. So this usually happens because some unfortunate, uh, you know, quill, uh, the body is uh, disfigured. So this, uh, these individuals, they won't survive for long. And again, here on the left, uh, you see uh, mite infestation. What happens is these mites enter the body of the larvae, and when the dragonfly comes out, they will be attaching themselves to the body, which affects the 
flight and the balance of the uh, individual and uh, it has a short life. It will, it will die or it will fall prey to some other uh, you know, predators. Uh, here you see uh, another fungal infected uh, dragonfly. And then there are predators. Dragonfly, even though it is an apex predator among the insect world, it has predators like uh, you know, geckos, praying mantis, spiders, and here you see a beautiful photograph of a small grass, a small green bee eater, you know, catching a dragonfly. Uh, now we are coming to the you know tail end, but I'd like to show this because I love this video. I've seen it a hundred times. This is a video of a uh, frog catching it. It's a bit long, so I won't show you fully, unfortunately. Actually, I'm, I'm sorry because of the you know uh, uh, limitations of time. I'm cutting it short. What happens in the final? This thing is the frog really jumps out and catches the dragonfly. It's a bit long. Like uh, uh, I'd, I'd love to show it to you uh, in full, but let me uh, cut it there. Now, uh, why do you why do you study aquatic and semi-aquatic insects? Because they are as very good biocontrol agents, which I already told you, like catching their mosquitoes, uh, mosquitoes, and you know, other uh, insects which are, uh, which are, you know, which are which affect our crops. Okay, so that's why it's a farm. It's also called farmers' friends. Japan, Jap Japanese people, they love. They they have even dragonfly temples uh, in uh, in that country, and then it's a key component in the food web. Because as you saw, the, the numerous predators that prey on dragonfly, so that's a key component in the food web. Uh, and as a larvae also, that's a food for fish and all that. And easy to sample because they are very obvious. They are big, big in size, they fly around you. And uh, there are plenty of, you know, large number of them. And then uh, in the forthcoming uh, sessions, you will learn how uh, dragonfly is... Uh, are used as a bioindicator. How uh, they survive? I mean, they 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 are used as a uh, an indicator of the pollution. Uh, so that I don't I won't go to uh, go into all that in detail. And uh, and predators of equity. Yes, these are all what I uh, said right now. So that's the important. That's the uh, significance of dragonflies in the in the larger system. Because of all these reasons, that's why. Uh, uh, well, the dragonfly is basically an aquatic concept, isn't it? Because uh, they spend most of the life in water. Sorry. And this is, uh, I'm putting it very briefly in one slide. Significance of order needs. Why? Because they are very, uh, I mean, they are key components of the wetland ecosystem, which uh, Vivek Sandra in his session will be talking to you in detail and play an important role in the wetland food chain. Like I said earlier, they are uh, they're food for not only for fish, for other uh, uh, there are other uh, predators, underwater predators. Uh, they eat uh, dragonfly larvae, and uh, uh, like like uh, like the birds and the lizards, you know, they're all the things. So, so there's an important role in the wetland food chain. And lar again, they themselves larvae and adult predators. 
than the high species diversity and endemism. India has got a, a very, especially Kerala, has got a lot of endemic species. So that's also because endemic species are very specific to their habitats and uh, by studying the uh, individual, studying the particular uh, um, species, you can, uh, you can understand, you can learn about the uh, habitat also. And that's why it said highly sensitive to changes in habitat quality because of that sensitivity. When there is some kind of pollution happen, and then you suddenly see that some species have disappeared. Like we, in SOS, uh, we have done studies be before and after the floods. You know, you remember that uh, floods that happened in 2018 and 2019. So there was a remarkable difference in the, uh, in the diversity and, uh, you know, uh, number of uh, dragonflies in the same area, like in Priya Tiger Reserve, we conducted the survey, and in uh, Silent Valley also. And so that's why uh, we say that dragonflies are very sensitive to changes in habitat quality. So uh, we can uh, we can understand because of, because they are uh, they are in early indicators they are early indicators for uh, changes. We can also predict uh, what 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 will happen to the habitat. And taxonomy, yes, it is very well known and easy to identify and sample in the field. And uh, these are photographs by our great friend Dr. Subramanian. Uh, who is one of the foremost entomologists uh, in, in India, has discovered many, several species and done uh, a lot of studies in uh, ordinator and uh, aquatic uh, insects. So what you see here is weed infestation. These are the threats that dragonflies face. Threats uh, uh, that because of, because of us, the kind of changes that uh, we are making to our, uh, you know, all these wetlands, like weed infestation, like mining, uh, like this uh, infestation of Mycania micranda. So this is an, again an invasive species and habitat loss. Originally this is a grassland, now that and there was a stream going through that area. Now that has been converted into a football field. So all these affect the uh, diversity and abundance of dragonflies. Again, uh, uh, you see the pollution. This is the Akar Anir Dekanal um, uh, The river is highly polluted, industry pollution. So there are no, even drag, not even dragonflies can uh, survive there. And you see the roads and tunnels. You can see a, a bulldozer, bulldozer or something, JCB, right at the top of the hill. So this kind of habitat destruction uh, would definitely endanger dragonflies also. And you see the African catfish. You know, these, all these prey on uh, dragonfly larvae and uh, uh, their, uh, you know, survival becomes a uh, question mark. Then there is a habitat degradation. I don't have to tell uh, who did it, isn't it? Okay, now we are coming to the uh, end. These are uh, my friends in uh, Society for Ordinate Studies and many other good friends who provided photographs and uh, helped in, you know, preparing the study material. Yes, sir, I will just briefly talk about uh, SOS Society for Ordinate Studies. We have a website called ordinatesociety.org. If you can visit, you can freely download the book called Introduction to Ordinator, which has detailed description about 175 species till they found in Kerala. This has been coming on also, you can find most of the species that is found here. There is not much difference between Tamil Nadu and Kerala. So you can just see species there also. And there is a bilingual book. Uh, this is one of the earliest books on dragonflies in Malayalam. It's a bilingual, it's partly in English also. But uh, it's, a, it's got some limitation like because it was published in 2014. It's slightly outdated. And there are some other publications developed by us. And uh, I would request and, uh, students from Kerala as well as Tamil Nadu to, to visit our uh, Facebook page called Dragonflies of Kerala. It's a very highly interactive group. We have about 2,500 members. So many youngsters, you know, take putting photographs and asking identification, asking questions. And uh, so you're all welcome to join them. 
but I ensure you, I mean, I uh, request you to, you know, visit our website and download this book. It's a free e-book. Uh, this is an excellent reference for uh, any study of any level of uh, ordinatology. So, uh, with that, uh, I come to the end of the session. I would have loved to show you more about the significance, but uh, I mean, significance then the ecosystem and all that. But I thought this being a first session, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not fully aware of the, uh, you know, state of your awareness, like level of your awareness. Even though you are, you may be small students. So I thought uh, a proper introduction, simple introduction to the entire topic that will, you know, spark off an interest in uh, you. And uh, I hope that this will serve as a baseline uh, for uh, whatever uh, for the future, the, the next four classes that you'll be listening to. So once again, uh, thank you, uh, both colleges, St. Joseph Salapi and Bullard um, College for Women in Road and uh, State Biodiversity Board. Thank you for providing me a platform, not me, but Society for Ordinary Studies. And uh, I hope together we can make a little difference. Thank you. Over. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, one minute, Termina. Uh, participants are having any doubts, uh, we can ask now. Any questions? Okay, Ermina, then carry on. Okay, miss. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for this very informative session held over here. And I welcome Mr. Sujit V. Gobalan, expert consultant, conservation biologist, Society for Ordinate Studies, for the word of thanks. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you, Ermina. Actually, it has been a long session. I know much of you have been already spent a lot of time here, but it is my duty to thank each and every one of you here. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Mrs. Renia Pillay, uh, Member Secretary, Kerala State Biodiversity Board, because uh, uh, she has delivered a beautiful uh, inaugural address, emphasizing on the role of ordinates, and not only ordinates, but also uh, the what ordinates can do to ecosystem and what can they deliver in conservation of ecosystem. Thank you, ma'am, for your valuable time. I Again, I would like to thank uh, Dr. S. S. K. Jandi, Principal Vallar College for Women, for the felicitation address. And uh, Dr. Uh, Rita Letha Dikoto for the facilitated felicitation address. She's the Principal of St. Joseph College for Women. And uh, not at all, I, uh, because this all started uh, a society for, I'm a member, I'm an activity member of Society for Ordinary Studies. I'm very happy that uh, such a, these two principles has considered for such a great program because we have been for since long standing for the conservation ordinates. For last uh, six or seven months, we have been continuously doing webinars on, uh, on the, so as to bring awareness to the ordinatology in India and Kerala especially. Because we have been doing it a part of a festival called as Dragonfly Festival, entirely dedicated for dragonflies. Last last week we have been doing it in connection with Kerala State Biodiversity Board and Forest Departments because they are the prime stakeholders in conservation. It has been go, go, going too good then, and finally, it is the next generation like you people who who have to take over the conservation torch from us. So it is up to you to learn to understand and then take this conservation efforts much forward from us. So uh, I thank uh, Remia for inviting society and uh, the principals for giving consent to um, collaborate with the with Kerala State Biodiversity Board and Valdra College for Women and also St. Joseph College for Women. I thank you each and every one. And uh, uh, it will hit us much of less. Uh, interesting that I'm glad to thank uh, my own colleague, Dr. Mr. B. B. Balachandran, uh, he has been an inspiration for Society for Ordinary Studies. We have been having a lot of fall trips. Yes, it is always uh, it is interesting that we always start a session with Balachandran class because 
He's the best person to give you an introduction to ordinates. He's a much good person to make because he, he himself likes to speak to investors, make you aware, trying to inspire you, to bring you to ordinates, to conservation. Because conserving ordinates is not only you are looking at ordinates, but you are trying to conserve its habitat too. So conserving ordinate lot means lot than just, just looking at ordinates or just getting inspired by ordinates. You're conserving its habitat too. So, I thank uh, Balayendra and Sir Hola actually for this wonderful session. I, I understand that a lot of lot of youngsters would have been inspired by this. And uh, for all, I thank all collaborating institute and Society for Ordinary Studies on behalf as the coordinating member of this webinar. Thank you one and all because you are the participants. You are the one who has to make this a successful event. So I thank you one and all for being part of this beautiful event. Thank you. Over to you, Amina. Thank you, sir. So we are closing for the time being. We shall meet tomorrow at 2 p.m. for the next session by Dr. Pangaj Koparde, Assistant Professor, School of Ecology and Environmental Management, Faculty of Sustainability Studies, MIT World Peace University, Kothrud, Pune, Maharashtra, based on the topic Ordinates in Climate Change Studies. So once again, thank you all. Thank you so much.